the first domino is the most important. Now, we can all go online, and you probably have, have gone to see these elaborate domino setups. You can find videos of them on YouTube, you know, and, and there are some that are small and simple. There are some that are huge and intricate. But one thing that they all have in common is all these chain reactions from one domino to the next, whether it's a setup of 10 or 100 or 1,000, they all start with just one domino. That first domino is the most important because it sets everything that follows into motion. Today is January 1st, 2023. It feels like we're, we're living in, in the future, right? Uh, I love preaching on, on days like this because I know that if you actually made it to worship today, like you're, you're probably an all-in sort of person. You know, you, you don't want to miss anything. You're committed. Uh, how many people actually stayed up till midnight last night? That checks out a few people. A lot of people like, no. Some kids like, yeah. I love how kids like, that's their goal. I always want to stay up till midnight. Yeah, yeah. And then the rest of your life, you just want to go to bed at nine. That's your goal in life. Um, but you guys made it here anyway. Well done. Um, you can actually cool your jets a little bit. The nominations for best attendees, they don't come out for several more months. All right. Um, and if you're watching this on replay online, uh, you know, I see you too. You, uh, you know, you may have had more of a social life than, than some of us last night, but you found a way to tune in as well. Uh, well done. Um, but what's funny is this today, by all accounts, it's just another day on the calendar, right? January 1st. But there's something about today that, that feels significant. There's something about changing that 2022 to a 2023 that, that feels weighty. Uh, that, that turning the page means something. And, you know, this is a time of year where many of us, we find time to reflect and to, to clear the board and, and look to the future. You know, it's well known that this is the time of year. Many of us are looking at resolutions. And, you know, I have some of the most popular resolutions for this year on the screen here today. And when it comes to New Year's resolutions and goals, from year to year, they tend to be about the same. You can go back and look at 2022, 2021. Generally, the chart doesn't change much because people kind of want the same things out of life. The first three are, are always health goals, you know, exercise more, eat better, lose weight. Um, and then usually there's, there's a financial goal. There's a goal that's relational, you know, spend more time with loved ones. Um, social media use has been correlated negatively with, with mental health. And so a lot of times people want to work on that, want to use social media less, um, maybe have a career goal. And then kind of off the chart below would be things like quit smoking, drink less, um, you name it. These are the kind of the resolutions. And as, as I look at some of these, I, you know, I've made some of these. I'm guessing you probably have too. But what strikes me is how many of these seem motivated by fear or to come from a place of fear. And I'm reading into this a little bit, but, but I think it checks out. Just look at some of the wording, right? A lot of it is avoidance wording, things that we're not going to do. Or if it's not that, then it's here's an assumed standard that we are not meeting and we need to, to come up to that standard. I, I think a lot of the goals that, that we make in life doesn't even have to be resolutions, just goals in general. I think a lot of them are, are fear-based, that there's a part of us that knows that there's things we should be doing. There's a voice that's telling us that. Uh, and, you know, we know we fall short of that and, and we have our imperfections and that if we continue as is, we, we might regret it. And so we strike out to, to, you know, with these new goals to work on our weaknesses and to work on our vices. And on some level, that makes sense. But it also doesn't make sense because statistics show us that every year, 43% of New Year's resolutions fail by February. Um, that actually the stats say that long-term, only about 9% of people succeed in their New Year's resolutions. It's the, it's the same story basically every year, which might be why a good number of people, probably many of us, have just not even bothered anymore. What's the, what's the point? I mean, it's kind of like starting a diet over the holidays. If, if it's guaranteed to fail, why are we going to do it? You know, what's the point? And, and what, that, what that realization should tell us 
is that the way most of us approach personal growth is off track. It's, it's flawed. And when any chain of dominoes breaks down and only half or a, a certain number of the dominoes fall, we have to trace the line back to the point of failure. If we have to, go all the way back to the first domino. Today, we're going to be kicking off, as we kick off this series, we're going to be digging into what brings about real, meaningful, lasting change in our lives. And we're going to be unpacking that over the next three weeks. But God's heart for us is, you know, something that we, we believe is near and dear, is that he wants more for us. But when there's a breakdown, we're going we're to look at all the factors in place. We can figure out how to make more meaningful, lasting goals. Uh, but today, our piece of it is just to go back to the beginning, to take a deeper look at how our goals are being set up, to look at how that first domino is, is being placed on the board. Because the, the path to a, a better life starts with vision for where to go. And for vision today, we're going to start with God's word. We're going to be in Luke chapter 5 today. And in the gospel of Luke, it's one of those parts of the Christian script where there's four gospels, um, and they tell, they chronicle the story of Jesus's incarnate ministry, his earthly ministry. And, and in the gospel of Luke, and really in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we read, um, and even John, as we read, we find that if you spent last night ringing in the new year at a party, that you're in good company. As we le read through scripture, we find that it's full of stories of Jesus attending parties, of him eating and drinking and, and rubbing elbows with real everyday people. And in fact, a big part of what we hope for as Christians is for what, what scripture calls the marriage feast of the lamb, which is fancy poetic talk for the big party in heaven that's gonna happen when heaven meets earth and Jesus comes again. That, that's, that's something we long for. And so parties are a good thing. But where we are today in Luke 5, it's a party that's being thrown by a man named Levi. He's a tax collector. Uh, he, he throws a party. Jesus and his disciples attend. And at this party, Jesus says something really profound about change. And this first part of the passage is gonna set things up for us. It says, then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. So the setup here is there's a lot of groups of people at this party. Uh, we, we have ordinary people, you know, friends of, of Levi's, tax collectors, and so on. Uh, we've got Jesus' disciples, who are basically ordinary people. Um, you know, the, the disciples of John the Baptist are referenced. Uh, and then we have this other group present, the, the Pharisees. The Pharisees are an interesting group. This is the first time in the Gospel of Luke that he mentions them, is in chapter 5 here. And the Pharisees were a group of highly religious highly influential legalists. And their vision of life clashed significantly, it differed significantly with Jesus's vision for life. And so as a result, they're gonna, gonna continue, you know, continue to clash with Jesus from this point forward in the narrative. Uh, and with them at the party, this party, the thing they really latch onto is this whole fasting issue. Why, you know, good disciples fast, why aren't Jesus' disciples fasting? And, and this is the answer Jesus gives. He says, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? No. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. So in other words, Jesus says this. He, he says, uh, you know, would you expect people to fast at a wedding? No. No. It's a time for, for celebration. And in fact, in Jewish culture, uh, going, attending a wedding would exempt you from any fasting that would ordinarily have been required or uh, under circumstances like a Jewish holiday or, or a vow or something like that. Um, you wouldn't have to fast. And Jesus is saying the situation is essentially like that, that he is a groom, that there's going to be a wedding. His disciples are guests of that wedding. They're in the wedding party, so they're, they're exempt. 
That's, the, that's why they're not fasting. And that's an interesting, that's a very curious thing for Jesus to say, given that he never marries. But what's going on here is that Jesus and the scriptures, they often use the marital relationship as an analogy for God's relationship with us. You know, remember at the beginning, we talked about that marriage feast of the lamb, right? And this is a word picture that Jesus paints, and, and I'm sure it goes over the heads of the Pharisees in this moment. You know, clearly God is up to something in that regard, but it's lost on them. But he does give two very clear metaphors then, thankfully, very simple and very clear metaphors in answer to the question they proposed. And the first is this. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And so it's a short parable. Um, but, but think about the image. Think about this garment. If our lives are our garments and we weave these garments of our lives painstakingly over the course of years and they have many threads, then inevitably holes are, are going to show up. There's going to be parts of our life that, that aren't right. And so there's, there's, what are we going to do with those holes? What are we going to do to keep the threads from unraveling our future? And the Pharisees, their answer to this question, their approach would be this, that, that their whole thing was to obsess over the imperfections. And we, could, we should be laser focused on them. We should be, you know, and they tapped into people's feelings of fear and of insecurity so well. Um, because they, they would be saying, you know, hey, focus, your focus should be on avoiding the things that made those holes in the first place, right? If you live your life the right way, you obey all the rules and we'll give you the rules, uh, then you can patch up your life. Then God won't be angry with you anymore. You just clean things up a little bit and do everything right. They, they were masters of the here's what you should be doing guilt trip. But the problem with guilt is it's a really poor motivator. It's only going to take you so far in life. It'll take you to about February. <laughs> because the reality is, is that when we make resolutions like that, when we make goals centered on avoidance and restriction, they only produce temporary resolve. They don't get us to the place we want to go. They don't get us to a place of better and more whole life. And they, they play on our shoulds, the voices of guilt and fear. Those are the voices we listen to year after year. But, you know, it's because we know that we should lose weight. We should save money. We should do less social media. We should do all the things. The list goes on, right? And the, when, but when those become our aims, we're, we're essentially doing the same thing. We're letting our inner Pharisee come out and sit at the sewing machine with our garment. Jesus says that, hey, just like a new patch, just like how this, you know, fully colored, unshrunk piece of cloth is not going to match the old garment, the color's not going to be the same, it's going to pull away, it's, it's not going to work, right? So, too, he says that his vision for our lives is incompatible with the natural inclination that we have to buy the promise of these patches that, that aren't going to work, that, that haven't worked, they don't get us any closer to God or the whole life that he wants for us. And, and Jesus continues to reinforce this with the second metaphor. He says, and no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And so in similar fashion to the first metaphor, we, we have this point, right, that it's, you know, some things are incompatible, that the true path to a better life doesn't start with superficial action, it begins with vision. And specifically, Jesus' vision for our life. And his vision can't be just appended to their old vision, that you can't blend the, the best of both worlds into one approach, right? It's a fundamentally different, different approach. It's a way of finding wholeness that's new. And, and, you know, while the same basic message of the first metaphor is, is here in the second with the wine, Jesus, he adds an interesting thought to the end. He says, and no one after drinking old wine 
wants the new, for they say the old is better. Now, if you drink wine, <laughs> you know the old is better, right? Um, there are other situations in life where old is better. But don't miss the point here, that in this metaphor, Jesus is on the side of the new. He wants something new for us because the old ways, that they're just not serving us. And if we really want change in our lives, we want progress, we want, want things to actually go well, we have to begin to ditch some of the old way thinking and be open to the message that Jesus brings. Some of you guys are in a spot, I think all of us are probably to some extent are in a spot where there's things that we'd like to change, but you may be thinking it's not possible. There's things uh, in your life that you, you know, you've set out, you want them to be better, but that you haven't been able to make progress in that area. And, and it you know, can feel a little dejecting, right? And, and the theoretically, we know it is possible to make progress. It is possible to change and to bring transformation to that area of our lives. I mean, I mean, after all, we've changed things about our life in the past, right? And, you know, we see stories on social media and elsewhere of tons of people who have made transformational changes in their lives. And yet, for some reason, with what you're thinking of now, there, it just doesn't seem to be working out in the same way, and, and you're not really sure why. And sometimes it can even lead us to a spot of, gosh, is this change even possible? It seems out of reach. And... When I was thinking about this over the past couple of weeks, it led me to a point of, okay, then what's the difference? What is it that makes people really change? What is the key to people actually being successful? Why do they really change? Just think about, you know, your own life. Think about the things in your past that you actually have been successful at changing. What have you won at? And what was the reason you were able to do it? In my own life, one thing I, th I thought of was in my fitness journey, how, uh, you know, I was thinking about how I was finally able to make progress at a certain point. That up until then, I sort of have spurts of progress, and, and then I, you know, would backslide and have droughts. And you know, then in 2017, I ruptured my, my left Achilles tendon. Um, I smile, pastors smile a lot, but it wasn't a smiling moment. Um, it was after I writhed around on the ground for a little while. You know, I'd been playing with basketball in my backyard with friends. And, you know, it happened. I was writhing around on the ground for a while, and I was like, I don't know what's going on with this. I've never really been injured before. Maybe it's just a sprain or something. And so I did what, you know, anyone would do. I poured myself a drink to take the edge off and uh, decided, you know what, I'll see, you know, overnight, we'll see if this is any better. And then I, I woke up in the morning and, you know, the thing was all swollen up and, you know, even looking at it was like shooting pain and I had to crawl everywhere that I wanted to go. And I was like, okay, it's clear now that I need medical attention. I, you know, I was like, Megan, hospital. Um, so, you know, go to the urgent care and long story short, uh, I was in surgery two days later and um, took me seven weeks before I could walk again. And I had to go to PT like twice a week for a year. It was quite the journey. but. What doctors told me um, is that I fit the image, the stereotype of an Achilles rupturer to a T. Um, you know, that they, they were like, okay, it's usually kind of this person who's getting a little bit older, maybe you're a little bit overweight, and, but you're still, you know, out there pushing your body, trying to do things. And I'm like, hey, what are you saying? But I remember them saying that, and that was motivating for me, I, I felt like. And after that moment, I was able to make significant change in my fitness journey. I made changes to my nutrition, to my exercise routines, and I always felt like that change came from a spot of, gosh, I don't wanna ever get in this spot again. I don't wanna leave myself exposed for something like this to happen. And so I had this motivation of like, never again, you know, as much as it's within my control, right? But the more I think about it, the more I think that that wasn't all that, that was it. I don't think that's the full story. That's selective memory. I think there was more to it than just, I want to avoid injury or look better in a, a t-shirt or, or whatever else, right? I think it was that I began to figure out what I really wanted. And I think so many of us, you know, we don't ask this question. We don't ask, what do I want? Actually, actually what do I really want? So many times we don't do this. And I'll give you an example um, from one of our resolutions on the chart. Uh, let's say um, 
Saving money. A lot of people want to save money. So let's say we all want to save money today. Um, you know, that, that goal right there to save money, I don't see how that's motivational at all. I don't know about you, that doesn't feel exciting. That doesn't feel like it will bring me joy. Saving money, I'm like, okay. Uh, that, that's kind of like saying, this year I would love to use my socket wrench a lot, a lot more. <laughs> you know, sure, it makes a fun clicking sound when you, you twirl it, but it's a tool. I'm not going to pull it out and use it unless I have a really good reason to use it, right? It, there has to be a purpose behind it. And so when, when it comes to saving money, it's the same thing. What's the point? If I say, why do you want to save money? You might say, you know, so I have some coverage, some, some extra in case of unexpected expenses. Okay, that's better, uh, but it's still a fear-based motivation. It's still a, trying to avoid a pain point. Why do you really want to save money? Um, maybe I don't want the anxiety of worrying about money or of arguing about money anymore. Okay, why do you really want to save money? Oh, because my family, we want more margins so we can take more road trips together and spend time together. Okay, now we're talking, right? When we, when we get to that point where suddenly we're able to identify what we really want, then we're talking, then we're figuring out why people really change because we're latching on a hopeful and positive vision for the future. We're not just going, here's what I'm going away from, but we're going, here's what I'm going to. This is what I am excited about. This brings me hope for the future. That is how people change, is because they can picture it. And ultimately, in my own fitness journey, you know, I began to make progress when I began to focus on all of the good things that I would be able to do that, you know, having a, a fit body would enable me to do. And there's a lot of great things you can do when that's not an obstacle and you have the ability to do all this stuff, anything you set your mind to, right? And, and sure, losing weight and, and eating well, They've still been a part of my journey, but those serve the greater vision of what I want, right? And because I have a compelling vision that I'm looking forward to, I have a deeper well of motivation to draw from when that stuff gets hard, and it inevitably does. And I don't think this is just mind games. It may sound just like, a, you know, flipping a negative to a positive or whatever else. It may, it may seem just like a semantic thing. I don't think it is. I think it actually matters. I think it's a fundamentally different approach to how we go about growth. Right before Christmas, you may have caught this, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky spoke to U.S. Congress. And as he spoke, you know, I caught, I caught it not live, but on replay. And as he spoke, I was listening in and he said a lot of, inspiring things, you know, like you can imagine how they've held their own against a much superior force and better equipped force. And, and you're like, wow, it's amazing. But the thing that really stuck out to me uh, out of his speech was his conviction, his very clear stated intention that they're going to win the war and they're going to win it in 2023. And as I listened, I was just like, wow, uh, that kind of blew me away. And I was like, my goodness, I think they can actually do it. And I, and I began to believe him. You see, seeing something so clearly, it's such a critical part of knocking over that first domino. Um, in this series, we're gonna be giving you an acronym, a, a tool to help you out as you seek to bring lasting change in your own lives. And each week we're gonna be giving you another piece of the acronym and you know, it will help us we hope and will help you along your journey of transformation. And that acronym that we're gonna give you is DMNO. This is short for domino. And the first part of it, the D, is determine your destination. Determine your destination. It's really important to see where you're going to determine, you know, to, to have that dream, to have that vision, to motivate you. Uh, when President Zaleski's visit, you know, with that there were a lot of comparisons made to Winston Churchill and something he said in 1941. Uh, you know, Winston Churchill, uh, of course, the Prime Minister of England. Um, in 1941, all of Europe was firmly in German hands. Um, the British and the French and the Allied forces uh, had evacuated and were across the channel. Um, and then Pearl Harbor was bombed and the United States was about to get into the war. And, and he came over and he spoke to Congress and he, he said this, 
He said, sure I am that this day, now we are masters of our fate. That the task which has been set before us is not above our strength, that its pangs and its toils are not beyond our endurance. As long as we have faith in our cause and an unconquerable willpower, salvation will not be denied us. And he was right. Before a single allied soldier had ever invaded France or Italy, he said these words with conviction and he was right. We cannot underestimate the power of seeing the goal in your mind, but also believing that it's actually possible. That's how we determine our destination. You've heard that mindset is everything, right? We've all, we've all heard mindset is everything and, and it is, but some of you are also thinking right now that mindset's not everything, that there are some things in life that, that we can't change just through wishful thinking, just through some sort of you know, mind trick. And, and certainly, you're right, it can't. There, there are some things that can't be changed just by flipping that, that switch in our brain. And, and also there'd be some things that wouldn't even be healthy for us to pursue. Some things we could set our minds to just aren't gonna be good for us. There are some goals in life that are really about our own pride or, or vanity. Uh, there, are, there are some things that are about, you know, becoming powerful or famous or rich or even getting revenge or being competitive or you name it. There's some goals that the pursuit of those is going to cost us our character or integrity or our, our faith journey or our mental health or, or, or whatever. It's going to come at a cost to our wholeness. And so when it comes to determining our destination, the only way that that actually makes our lives better is when our destination that's being determined is aligned with God's vision and God's priorities for our life. That is what truly sets us in the right direction. The Pharisees, as we think about them, they found themselves constantly clashing with Jesus because their vision and his vision were not aligned. They didn't match. Their vision for wholeness and health was that they thought, gosh, if we align our actions with what God expects, then... God will, you know, acknowledge us. He'll, he'll um, approve of us. But what God really wants is our heart. He wants our hearts to align with his heart, for us to have his, his love, the, for us to care about the things he cares about, to see things the way that he sees them. And too often we've determined our own destination without him, and we've set out in vain. The Psalms tell us, that unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain, that it is gonna to come to ruin. And in our own lives, when we think about things that, that just aren't working, the, the progress that's not being made, if we are in a point of stagnation, the best thing we can do is to give God our garment, to show him the holes in the threads, the, the places where it's unraveling and trust that he's able to do with that far more than we can as we try and patch it on our own. And I know this is true and it, it fills me with hope that God has already envisioned your destination. He sent Jesus to, to lead us, uh, not, not only through death at the crucifixion, but also Jesus was resurrected. He rose again to new life that, that we too might have new life. New life is what he has appointed us to. God's vision for us has us at that marriage feast, has us at that party when heaven meets earth. That's what Jesus came to do, and it's what he's still doing. And that's a compelling vision. That's where we want to go. That's where we want to end up. And, and that propels us forward. And, and what's cool is that's only part of what God has envisioned for us. That describes justification, uh, this idea of, hey, God wants us to spend eternity with him at that party. But also God has us on a journey to engage us in sanctification as well, that he wants us to experience a life of engaging and transforming our hearts and our minds and our desires to match his own over the course of our years. And this is the thing that we have to get straight. This is the, the thing that we, we always get a little bit wrong is that God is not only interested in our spiritual transformation, but in our total transformation. He, he has our eternal destiny, but he also wants to redeem every day from now 
until then. He wants to bring us a more whole picture of life. And it, and it starts now. That the transformation that, that he brings is not just in the mind, but it flows into every part of, of who we are. And when it comes about the things that we're discontent with, the things that we want to change in our lives, there's nothing that we're thinking of that God doesn't already know of. There's no, no hole that he's not already aware of. And when it, when it comes to the places that we want to go, there's no good thing that we can imagine for ourselves and our lives that he hasn't first thought of, seen, and desired for you. And so a great question with the God who loves us and who sees the best for us is what does God want for me? Jesus, in another place in scripture, he answered that question. You know, we, we talked a lot about this at Pathfinder, how God wants to bring us whole life in every area of our life. That it doesn't just stop, like we said, with the mind, but it, it includes every facet of our being. That he wants us to be filled with joy and peace and have hope for the future and use our gifts and be about his mission of serving others. And along the way, he would love it for us to get more physically and, and mentally healthy and, and for us to use our finances more in alignment with heavenly things and to learn more about scripture and, and to have more meaningful relationships and careers and, and so forth. God would love all of these things because they're in line with the vision that he has spoken and given to us in scripture. And he wants the transformation that he's building in here to match the transformation that he's bringing to here. But that doesn't mean that, that he gives us a magic bullet, that we're gonna avoid all the, the hard stuff. You know, we can get whatever we want, regardless of, of what it is, and, and that, you know, we're gonna be able to um, never be in need or never have to sacrifice or have hardship. That's not what it means. I don't know, you know, it doesn't mean that we're gonna exactly know his vision 100% of the time. Sometimes we're gonna struggle with it. But what I do know is that when we start with Jesus's words in Matthew 6, 6 this is where it begins. He says, do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness. And then all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him first with, with ever, all those things. And, and we don't have to know necessarily what the path forward looks like entirely, what the chain of dominoes from this point forward looks like from beginning to end. We just have to know God and trust that he has our best interest at heart. He cares about us. And wherever he leads us in faith, it's gonna be good. It's gonna be amazing. And that when we set our goals by seeking him first, that's how we determine our destination and, and we do it with real determination and hope. Because the goals that we set that are in alignment with God's vision for us, those are the best resolutions we can possibly make. They're the most compelling resolutions. And when we know that God is for what we're seeking, then we draw from his strength in the journey. And so I don't know about you, but what is it, what's a discontent that you have right now that God wants to work on, to mature into a more full vision for wholeness that you can pursue. Because we can move mountains when what we pray for and what God wants for us are the same things. I, I saw a post just the other day on social media that, that talked about a guy who made a resolution last year that kept it all the way to this year. And he had this to say, he said, don't let people trick you into thinking all New Year's resolutions are useless. People really can stick to them and you can too. And so I know it's stereotypical to make New Year's resolutions and a lot of people that make them, you know, even us in the past have made resolutions that have predictably failed and haven't gone about it in the right way. But maybe there's something about this practice that God wants to redeem. Why not now? Because you know what, there's no time uh, that's bad for exploring what God's vision is for our wholeness, for our life, for our future. And so I know when we set out to explore that with God, that he's gonna 
bless that in some way or another. He's going to redeem that and, and use it. And you know what? Success or, or failure, know that God's love is yours. He's going to be, at you, be there to party with you. Um, but also know this, that sanctification is about taking the step. It's about making the move, pointing to the, fa- the fences and saying, let's go in faith and let's see where God leads. That's how the first domino falls with vision. But that's not all there is to seeing it through. And so I encourage you guys, come back over the next three weeks. If you wanna learn how to take motivation and translate that into real meaningful change and stay on track, you're gonna need the next three weeks with us. So I encourage you to come back and explore more of that together with us. God, we thank you for this time here this morning as we've dug into your word. Um, And we see Lord that you have great things in store for us, more beautiful things than we can even imagine. And Lord, we've been tempted to to go it on our own at times or just to come up with whatever vision for our lives based on the shoulds that come at us in society, the shoulds that come at us from the inner Pharisee within. But God, show us today your new way. Help us to be new wineskins for that which you desire. Lord, may we be people who never just give up and go, it's, it's not possible. But Lord, help us to see with clarity and to be able to hope, to know that you desire to walk with us, to bring transformation to all aspects of who we are, because that's what the gospel does. It changes hearts and minds and lives all the way through. We thank you for this. We thank you for constantly being our guide and our leader. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our online Pathfinder community. If you're new here, you can find helpful links to resources in the description below or on our website at pathfinderstl.org. To make sure you don't miss out on new content from us, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell to be notified the moment we go live or post a new video. Lastly, just a reminder to hit that like, share, and comment button. Uh, We love getting to hear from you, and we love sharing this message with others that you may know. And that's it for today. Again, have a happy new year. Blessings to you.